Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where we chat with startup founders just like you from all over the globe. Each episode, we bring you practical and actionable tips to help you escape the cubicle and begin your own startup journey. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. Here's a quick word from our sponsor, Podbrand Media. As a business owner, new sales leads are essential. At Podbrand Media, we create a branded podcast for you to generate those leads by interviewing your best potential clients as subject matter experts. Not only creating great rapport, but also great content to share in your industry. Affordable and effective. Contact us today at podbrandmedia.com to learn more. This is Kevin Pro with another episode of Rising Tide Startups. And my special guest today is Sari Ibrahim. Sari, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Hey, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been such great. You just really be able to chat before we hit the record button. But if you and I met at like a networking event, like a business networking event, how would you introduce yourself to me? Yeah, definitely. It's it's usually a little bit unusual for me to do so because I can't just say like I'm a doctor or a lawyer or engineer or something <laughs> like people know. Uh, so I'm I'm in the financial services space and I help small businesses and individuals become their own sources of financing. So I help solve financial problems for individuals and small businesses. I think that's a, probably the clearest way uh, to kind of describe what I do. So let me unpack that just a little bit. So nobody yeah. just wakes up one day and says, you know what, I, I want to help people solve their financial or financing issues. So what walk us through kind of the journey? How did you, you know, I said, I went to college, I did this, I majored in this, I worked for New York Life, I, mm -hmm. you know, what what was your pathway that you walked? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think this path kind of found me. So I, I started when I was about midway through my MBA program in Chicago, and I was doing my MBA with a concentration in project management. So that was my initial goal, right? To be a, get my uh, MBA and then do like the PMP certification, become a mm -hmm. project manager. And then um, I started an internship. It was not really internship. It was more, more of like my first job at Allstate Insurance. And I really yeah. liked yeah. working with clients. I really liked working in like the sales and marketing department. And uh, from there, I pursued, I kept, I finished my MBA, kept the concentration in project manager because I had already gone too far into the program. Uh, but then when I graduated, I didn't really do any, pro I've never done anything in project management, like mm -hmm. a inter internship or a job. I just stayed in the insurance space. So I really enjoyed it, worked at Allstate. And then uh, for about a year or so, then left and started my own business. And when I started my, it was a Medicare brokerage. So I did like mm -hmm. Medicare products for uh, people who, who are retiring in the city of Chicago. That was like my yeah. primary niche, like people who retired, they needed to transition from their city plan to their own plan. So mm -hmm. I helped them make that transition. And then one of my clients at that time asked me if I could help him with like other financial products, like annuities, cash value, life insurance. And I told him probably. So I started, <laughs> so I started doing, re I started doing research, started reading books and him and I were close. So he knew that I was just starting off in the financial product space. So I uh, I got my additional uh, contract with other insurance companies. And then now fast forward to today, that's exactly what I do. I help clients mostly on the financial product side, like cash value, life insurance, annuities. Mm -hmm. and I'm part of the bank on yourself organization. So that, I mean, I'm assuming that requires stuff like Series E, 6, 60, I mean, all those li insurance licenses to, to be able to talk about those products. So mostly it's uh, since... Since I only deal with usually fixed insurance products like fixed um, index annuities and cash value life insurance, it's just a health and life license. Okay. But I am working on doing my certified the the CFP program, the Certified right. Financial yeah. Planner program. I actually I finished all the courses for it. I have one more course, the the final business the side the final presentation course, and then I'm taking the final exam in November this year. So uh, after I, after I pass that, then I'll become a CFP professional. And really in in, the, in what I'm doing, the type of work that I'm doing, it, it doesn't need anything beyond a life and health license, but mm -hmm. obviously like I want to, I want to I wanna be able to have like more knowledge, like working with clients. Yeah. So that's why I pursued the CFP program. And, you know, those three letters after your name, they add credibility, you know, on a, yeah. on a business card type thing. So, Hey, uh, Mabruk on the, uh, <laughs> on the uh, certificate. Cause I, I mean, I I'm actually a CPCU, which oh, is really? charter property and casualty yeah. underwriter. So I know how difficult that series of tests are, but yeah, um, man, it's, it's it's really interesting to hear kind of that journey. But so really, you were never in the sales side of things, I guess, other, other than maybe Medicare supplements and things like that, that you were working in. But as far as life insurance and as far as, you know, those types of products, were you actually on the sales side or were you more on the marketing side? 
Uh, a little bit of both. So, so running my own um, agency, right? I, I had to do both. So, like, I had to be kind of like the CMO of the company. Like, I'm thinking of the all these different marketing ideas, going on podcasts, yeah. you know, LinkedIn, email marketing, all types of different marketing strategies. And then once those leads would come in, once once people would respond, then I'd also have to like put on my sales hat now. Mm -hmm. Um, and and my goal is to eventually like, uh, hopefully like uh branch like like be able to hire a mar a CMO. And be able to do a little bit more of the marketing, but as of now, even till now, I I'm like the I'm in charge of the marketing part and the sales part, and there's similarities, right? I think like overall they're different. Like if you were to ask yeah. me how do I describe the differences between marketing and sales, like marketing is like getting people to see your business, to come into your business, to go to your website. That's kind of the marketing, mm -hmm. and then sales would be like you convert those clients and you convert those visitors into eventually clients. So there are similarities, but but at the same time they are they're they're different at the same time. And that's kind of the the hard part about this is. When you um, and I think that your list, your listeners would appreciate this is that when you start your own business, right? It's not like you can just only do one thing. You could yeah, try to, yeah. but eventually you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to wear multiple hats. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the hardest thing. So, so I, I definitely recommend. There's a book I read. It's uh, Who Not How. I'm sure a lot. I'm sure you read mm -hmm. it. A lot of listeners read it. The book is amazing because it talks about how like you should definitely like reach out to different people in different areas mm -hmm. for help. So yeah, I, I highly recommend that book. Who Not How. It's uh, it sounds like the very first part of the book, the e-myth, you know, talking yeah. about, you know, learning to work, you know, work on your business instead of in it, because yeah. like, you're right. When you start out, you you're empty and trash and you're the president of the company <laughs> at the same time. So there's, there's this, it's all together. There's no, all my bad. There's no difference between the, the, uh, the, the start to the finish, but uh, it, it is, it is an interesting like journey that you've described. And I, I really want to kind of get a little more granular and really talk yeah. about this, this concept that if people look, you know, type in your name and in Google, this pops up all the time. That's, you know, be your own bank, you know, yeah. concept. So let's, what, what is that? And kind of give us the genesis of how you came up with that idea. Yeah, absolutely. So, so to just to be clear, I didn't come up with the idea. I, I'm part of. So the idea was in, initially introduced in Nelson Nash's book called "Becoming mm -hmm. Your Own Banker." Mm -hmm. It was introduced in like the '80s, and it was really a way for the author Nelson Nash to re kind of refinance all the debt he had at that time. He had uh, it was during the '80s, so interest rates were like 11 or 12 percent back then. They were much higher, and he was paying a lot of um, a lot of his money that he was earning was going back to like lenders. And then he thought about how common this problem is. And the, the problem is actually really common. About about 33% of the money we make on average goes to servicing debt, whether that's mortgages, car notes, student loans, credit cards. A lot of what we do involves like bank financing. So and that's about taxes. That's outside yeah, yeah, of taxes. Yeah, out, exactly. Outside of taxes. You're right. So he, Nelson Nash kind of designed this way of using cash value whole life insurance for you to become your own source of financing. And what that means is like a lot of people are like, well, I thought we were talking about business. I thought we were talking about finance. What does life insurance have to do with this? And really what it is, is that there's in general, two types of life insurance. There's term, which is like temporary life insurance. There's a start date. I know you know this, but the audience, for the audience to know this, mm -hmm. there's like a start date and an end date for term. And there's no cash value in it. There's just life insurance itself. And then the other kind is cash value life insurance. So there's cash value in the life insurance policy. It's usually, it's called permanent as well. So it's mm -hmm. for your whole life. And there's different types of permanent, but for the for this podcast, we'll talk about whole life insurance. And what it is, is you're using the cash in that policy to become your own source of financing. So like you could borrow against the policy, you could use it as collateral, and then you could use that to pay down other debt, to reinvest in your business. And there's there's a little bit more like there's tax benefits and liquidity benefits we can get into, but it, it kind of like in general, that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about here. That's what, what we're using is cash value, whole life insurance. So is it is it up to the amount of cash value that's built into the policy or can you borrow like up to a, a percentage of the of the life benefit of the policy? Yeah, good question. So when you start the policy, well, like when you put premiums into it, two things happen is you have like the death benefit, the life insurance part, and then you have a cash value column. Right. And they're kind of separate columns. And they both grow every year. So look, I can't really think of any like specific numbers right off the top of my head, but let's just say somebody's like 40 years old. They're like in good health. They did a policy that was like 10,000 a year. Year one, uh, again, don't quote me on these numbers, but year one, the death benefit could be like 400,000 in year one. And then the cash value is probably going to be like six or $7,000 in year right. one. 
and then they both keep growing every single year and eventually the cash value is going to exceed the premium so like it's it's almost like an investment with a return on which with the return on it mm -hmm. it's not really an investment but you can kind of think of it that way because the cash value eventually will increase more than the premiums and then you can at any point leverage they could leverage the policy you could borrow against it um and use it for essentially anything you want so you so your i guess your cash value has got to exceed what the annual premiums are before you can borrow against it? Or is that just makes it easier to borrow against? Good question. So you don't have to wait until the cash value exceeds the premiums. Like day one, you could put 10,000. For in the example I just mentioned, you could put 10,000 in and then borrow out about 6,000 in the first month. You could do mm -hmm. so. Um, so you won't be able to take out most of your money, but you could still, you could still, it's still liquid. That's the thing. It's, you don't have to lock up your money for like, you know, 10 or 20 years to be able to, you could access it from, from month one, uh, where you can access more than what you put into it. That's probably going to take like six or seven years to do where you get it, where you, you can exceed your basis, um, through the loans. And then you could also do, so you, you do that tax free. But this has to be a policy that you own. This is not like my life insurance through my work or something like that. So you, I think you would have to be the owner of the policy, right? Right, exactly. You're right. So usually we're mo in most situations, life insurance at work is usually term life insurance in, mo mm -hmm. in most cases. Yeah. And term has no cash value at right. all. That's one factor. And the other factor is, let's just say it was cash value, like whole life insurance at work, which is very rare. I, I have probably never seen that where you get life cash value life insurance at work. Mm -hmm. Um there, there, there could be some restrictions. Like the company could own the plan, and you're just the insured, mm -hmm. and they have access to the cash value. So, in order for this to really work, you need your own policy. That plus, I would also argue that, like, if you have term insurance through work, it's probably only like one to two times your annual salary. Yeah. So, if you make a hundred thousand a year, usually it's a, it's a a hundred thousand dollar death benefit, or maybe a two hundred thousand dollar death right. benefit, which is not much. If you talk to a lot of financial advisors and accountants and financial professionals. They'll recommend you have at least 20 to 15 to 20 times your annual income in life insurance. So that way, if something happens to you, like you could provide for your family because mm -hmm. it's like the, the the idea is it's going to take your family, you know, 15 or 20 years to become financially whole again. So that's kind of where the, the idea comes in. So even if you did have a term life policy through work, you'll I, I highly recommend you still look at life insurance outside of work for sure. Right. Yeah, that that's a that that is that makes a lot of sense. And I. I, it's interesting that that um, just the concept of you know borrowing against your life insurance policy. Let's talk about you know I don't I don't want to dig too deep into the weeds here, but let's just talk about like interest rates. You know when you're borrowing against that policy, let's talk about what happens if if you die while you've taken yep. you know money out of the policy. Those are those are two kind of big rocks that it'd be good to cover. Yeah. So interest, good questions. Interest rates right now are 5%. They've, they kind of been 5% for a while now. And what the way it works is let's just say you take out a loan and then they'll take 5%, they'll take 5 of that. And then you divide that by 365 days. So then your loan balance grows by that every single day. So it's simple interest. In other words, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a favorable way of borrowing money. It's simple interest. And then you pay that back whenever you want. You could literally pay that back monthly or annually. Whenever you want, you pay that back. You're in complete control of the policy. There are no credit implications. There's no credit checks. It's just the policy itself as collateral. That's it. So uh, that's one way. And then let's just say you take out a loan and you never pay back at all. Then what mm -hmm. would happen is let's just say like, you know, 50 or 60 years from now, the death benefit is $2 million. And then the loan you took out with the interest on it reached like, let's just say $100,000 in, in, in total that you owe to the insurance company. They'll just take $2 million minus the outstanding loan and then pay that to your beneficiary. So in this case, you know, $1.9 million would go to your beneficiary. So uh, th that's a good thing too about it is like for a lot of real estate investors and business owners, they could save cash, borrow against that, and then not have the pressure of having to pay back a loan yeah. within a certain period of time. They're in they're their own bankers. They're in mm -hmm. control of that. Yeah, that that is that is really interesting. What's the what's the downside? I mean, that, that sounds all those sound like upsides. So, yeah. what versus a conventional SBA loan or going to a bank or whatever? What are what are some of the downsides or possible downsides of of being your own bank? Yeah. So, like right now, for example, if I you know, if I have a hundred thousand in cash right now, right, I can go buy a property for four hundred thousand, right? I put twenty or twenty five percent down. I can buy a property uh, in most cases. Now, with life insurance, you can't really do that for, for the most part. You can't put a hundred thousand in a life policy and then borrow and then and then you know buy something that's 
um, much more than that. Right. So that's right. kind of the downside is that they're in the beginning, you don't have the same advantages of going to banks because typically, like, why do we go to banks, right? It's to be able to buy things that we can't afford right now. Mm -hmm. um, the advantage, though, with whole life insurance is eventually you'll be able to become the bank. So that's kind of like mm -hmm. it's kind of the trade off is that like I think banks are instantly um, beneficial to a lot of people. Um, but long term, they're not beneficial, and then vice versa. Like whole yeah. life insurance is not going to start off like a, with a major um, um, a gr instant gratification, but eventually, in the, in the long term, it becomes much better for you in the long term. So, so what you could do is you could do this. You could kind of have like a blend between the two. So you could, for example, let's just say in this example, you did have a hundred thousand in cash. It doesn't have to be a hundred thousand, but let's just say you did have a hundred thousand mm -hmm. in cash. You could put it into a life policy and then you could borrow against that. And then you could use the borrowed money with another bank loan as the down payment. And this is what's really interesting is that is that a lot of, because um, a lot of people might think that if you took out a loan against a life policy and then you use that borrowed money with another loan, that the bank is going to think that you're like over leveraged, like there's too many loans on this. And that's not necessarily true because the money that you borrowed against your whole life policy, the bank knows that you don't have to pay that back. And they know there's no set repayment for that. And they mm -hmm. know that if you default on that life insurance loan, then the life insurance company can't take anything beyond the life insurance policy. Yeah. So yeah. so you could use it alongside other financing. I, I see another huge benefit, especially for, for newer, you know, entrepreneurs, is that it's almost like you've got another another guardian to keep you from being over leveraged, you know, in debt. You know, if it's if you're limited to whatever the life benefit is of my policy, you know, it doesn't really matter if if, it, if I default on that or not, or if I don't pay that. But default's a bad word. If I don't pay that, yeah. you know, the the it back. But it's just, I'm just limited to the death benefit. You know, at maximum. Yeah. You know, so that that's really interesting. So so tell me, is there a learning curve when you're talking to people about this? Is there is there like ah, this sounds too good to be true? This is you know, this is kind of like voodoo magic here i mean what what do you what where's the shell game what are you trying to what are you not telling me about this this uh financing op opportunity yeah and, and sometimes it is it is uh we do have those conversations so it's kind of a it definitely it definitely takes a lot of like educate self-education on the clients and which is like why i do a lot of podcasting you know on on as a guest speaker as well as hosting my own podcast called thinking mm -hmm. like a bank so yeah. we talk about these strategies and i recommend if you want to if you if you've read up if you've heard about this concept somewhere else you know do your homework it, it does take a little bit more research to understand this um and i think that you know like when we go through our process right we have our financial analysis meeting we have and then after the financial analysis meeting we make these recommendations so it starts to make a little bit more sense for clients and the the good thing actually happens is initially it starts off as like what kind of you know like magic is this but mm -hmm. eventually when we go through the whole process and clients are learning more it actually ends up being to the point where using this type of strategy using cash value whole life insurance to be your own source of financing is really it's based off of logic. It's based off of math. There's nothing really like it's. It actually makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. than how than what banks are doing. So like yeah. you go to a bank, for example, right now, and you deposit money in a checking account or savings account. You and thousands of other people, and then you know, and then let's just say you and all these thousands of people want to go back and take your money out. <laughs> like the whole economy could crash. The whole banking mm -hmm. system could crash. So yeah. it, it, there's more logic in using life insurance than there is in the banking system. Yeah, and and insurance companies don't have the luxury of not having to hold the reserves, you yeah, know, yeah. on on hand for sure. But so walk us through the the process of how you kind of set up your business around this. I mean, is 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 your business built solely on the insurance products that you sell, and then this is kind of a just a benefit to to you know on the side? Or are you kind of consulting with people, or how exactly do, have you set your your own business up? Yeah, so it's set up as an independent insurance agency or, or mm -hmm. as we're in brokers, as brokerage, you know. Yeah. yeah, brokerage. So I could represent really any insurance company mm -hmm. that um, on the life and health side. I could do so if I wanted. I have my property and casualty license, but I really kind of stay away from that because I don't want to like, um, you know, go into uh, an area that I'm not that familiar with anymore, uh, especially like commercial property and casualty. So I, I stay more on the life and health side. I work with about right now about 10 different life insurance companies that are mostly cash by life insurance or annuities. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some other, I still service Medicare clients and independent or individual health insurance for like business owners. Cause it's really hard. You know, a lot of business owners have struggled getting health insurance. So I also help with yep. that too. But really, yeah. And, and, and I also use the concept too, like as 
as a client of these companies, I also use these policies for my for my business. So like I have, I use different strategies, like financial strategies. Like if you ever heard of like profit first, mm-hmm. how you pay yourself first, I yeah. use my policies for that as my profit and my income uh, buckets. Mm-hmm. Um, every every month, as soon as I get paid from these various insurance companies, a portion of that automatically goes into these policies before I even pay anybody else or anything. I they go into these policies, and then I use the policies. I borrow against them constantly. Borrow against these policies to uh, reinvest into business to pay expenses. So my goal is to kind of reca- recapture as much of the money that's flowing in to in through the business and out of the business as as much as possible, almost mm-hmm. like a net. And I and I try and I show that a lot to business owners, like when we go through like the, the our, our presentations, I show clients how they could literally like be in the middle between the money they're earning and the money they're spending, and be able to recoup as much as possible. It uh, just listening to your story, I uh, one of the questions that I love to ask on the podcast is the the whole idea of being an entrepreneur. You know, do you think that that is that is genetic? You know, I I think. You know, you were going to you're getting your you know product management you know licensure yeah. or degree or whatever. So I don't necessarily think you were headed in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that you know you may be a little bit of an anomaly. You know, to most people that I talk to on here, because they're like, yeah, I was selling candy on the playground <laughs> when I was six. You know? <laughs> you know, I was taking my my all of my mom's stuff and selling it in the garage sale. You know, in the in the garage type thing. But um, how did you quote become an entrepreneur? Yeah, you're you're so right. I didn't really see myself blending in, like working, you know, nine to five in a corporate setting, you know, having like 20 layers of bosses above me. (laughs) I really, I just didn't, I just couldn't see myself in that environment. I really couldn't. So um, you're right. I kind of felt like I'd always been an entrepreneur. I've, the most of my professional life has been entrepreneurship. So I think that it definitely blends in. I still, but 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 at the same time, I still have to. I still try to maintain that, like you know, obviously, the I have to maintain the discipline of like a work environment. Mm-hmm. I still have to work with other people. Um, I I don't. I never want to obviously like uh, change that. But you're right. I did. I did see myself kind of as an entrepreneur um, early on, and I think it is in my DNA. I think that I've always wanted to, um, just have more control of time and 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 income too. Like if you, for example, you know, you work at a company and you make, let's just say, you know, X amount, you know, fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. Even if you worked extra hard that year, and mm-hmm. let's just say you're in sales, you'd probably only have like a ten or twenty percent increase, depending on. In, in most cases, I don't want to generalize. It. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ten would be generous. <laughs> <That's right>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, and I and I just always see my. I always kind of like wanted more out of life, right? Like to spend more time. I, I I'm married now. I have a mm-hmm. son be able to spend more time with my family, be able to travel, you know, you and I were talking about, you know, going, you know, traveling to the Middle East. Mm-hmm. It's it's very expensive, right? To travel from yeah. the US across the, the Atlantic Ocean, you know, a, a once a year, twice a year, that's it's going to cost you a lot. So I want to kind of position my life in a way where that it, it wouldn't be so much of a, a burden or a problem to do so. Yeah, that that it, I mean, you're kind of a, a great blend, you know, of the two. So you're you're a blend of somebody that didn't necessarily start out that way, but you yeah. you certainly recognize some like characteristics in you that said, you know, I'm I'm really not very employable. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I don't I don't think I'm going to like working under a hierarchy of bosses. You know, tell yeah, me what yeah. to do. So I need to be my own boss. Not only my own bank, I need to be my own boss too. So. It is. Uh, that's a that is a an interesting you know segue from from what we were talking about. But I I am curious if you let's say that all this just kind of crashed overnight. Yeah. You woke up. The, you woke up tomorrow. You still got this entrepreneurial itch. Yeah. Uh, you got to do something. What would you do tomorrow based on what you know now? What What would you start as a as a business tomorrow? Oh yeah. Oh my God. So look, let's. I just know start. you would. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I would, I would definitely, I, w- I would retain my clients, even if the whatever we were doing is no longer available. I would try to retain my clients. I would try to retain my prospects. I would find, I would go to, through my network. I would try to find something else to market or to to help clients with another problem to solve. Right. Mm-hmm. I think for every, you know, for every door that closes, another door opens. So, like for yeah. example, like in 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 two thousand eight, right, like the real estate market crashed, like in sales, mm-hmm. yeah. but then leasing went up, right, in two thousand eight because people still needed a place to live. So that's kind of how my mentality would work. If like one thing crashed, something else is going to mm-hmm. go up. Um, so that's what I would do. I would look for what went down and then what went up, and then try to kind of ride that wave. And of course, it's it's mindset, right? Because I think the the solution wouldn't be necessarily to get a job. 
Um, I, I don't know if that's gonna if, if that's gonna work. And like you said, I, I don't think I'm employable now. I think that prior entrepreneurs are probably the least favored uh, <laughs> employees. <laughs> like, like companies probably don't like to see that. Like, oh, I I was running my own company for the last ten years, and now I want a job. It's yeah. probably not an employable feature. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think, I think I was telling my wife this other day, I think I kind of like trapped myself as an entrepreneur. I kind of imprisoned myself to the point where this is all I could do is just run companies. This is all I know to do. And I, and I can do, I can't really see myself going, uh, b uh b back to being an employee. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, brother, what you see as a trap, other people see as freedom. So I, <laughs> I, I you know, it's, it's, I guess it's all about perspective, you know, about what. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how you're viewing this, but yeah, just uh, share a little bit with us. I mean, just, you know, you being your own boss, if, if you could, you're talking to people that are listening to this podcast yeah. that are sitting in the cubicle right now going, oh, I hate my life. I got to do something. I got to break out of here somewhere. What are one or two just really key lessons that, that you've learned by being your own boss that you think would, regardless of whatever they wanted to do, but you think would be really helpful for them to, to be able to know that you wish you would have known kind of when you took that leap. Yeah. So, um, you know, things on it. So I guess a couple of things. So number one, when you are like, when you're constantly like, when you go from like high school to college to corporate life, you're in this kind of like mentality where things have to be like, things are scaled from like zero to a hundred and they mm -hmm. typically have to be as close to a hundred as possible. As far as your grades, as far as yeah. what you're yeah. doing, your job, your performance. And then when you become an entrepreneur, and then you'll soon you'll soon notice that you'll probably be like in the you know even if you're working really 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 hard you'll probably be in like the thirty or forty percent range like <laughs> as far as like like if you were grading from zero to a hundred and a lot of people might look at that as like that's bad you know mm. um and I think that entrepreneurship is not about like just zero to a hundred and if it doesn't work then you quit because because school teaches you that like if if you're in, if you're in college right now and you're getting C's and D's in math. Every teacher of yours, every counselor would tell you, stay, don't be an engineer, don't be an accountant, don't do anything with math. And that's not necessarily true. That's not how the world works, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> things are progressive. Things work like based off of progress on top of more and more progress. So you have to keep that in mind. So if you left your company, you were making, for example, 80,000 a year, and then you left and you started your own business and you're making zero now a year or 10,000 a year, that's not failure. That's just that's just based off of progress of year one. And then you, then you measure it based off of progress in year two and then progress in year three and so on. Mm. It, it, it's definitely, Love it's that. consistent with the, with the growth mindset, right? Read the book mindset by Carol Dweck. And she talks about this. She talks about the growth mindset and how it's, it's not based off of like just labeling yourself. Cause if, if you, for example, like got an F in math, you can't just label yourself as you're bad at math forever. You just weren't prepared at that time. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Like you know, like if I if I hopped on a plane right now and I went to and I landed in Paris, I don't speak any French at all. It doesn't mean that like I'll never be able to learn French. It's just, just that time when I landed at that moment, I don't speak French. But I, if I stay there for two or three or six months, I'll for sure be able to. I'll have to pick up because I think mm. you're not allowed to speak anything other than French in in France. So so I'll, I'll have to pick up on that. And the same is true in business. Like if you start off, you're in business and you're not doing well. Doesn't mean like you should label label yourself as not a good entrepreneur or not a good business mm, owner. That's it's just great, at that time at that time, right? That is a great great point. That's a great. So that's number one. So okay, let, let's end with a great number two here. Yeah. And then number two is that there's something like with insurance companies and banks I learned and like thinking like an underwriter thinking like a banker. I learned that there's something called like concentration risk, right? Concentration risk is if you were a business owner and you had one client only and that one client was mm -hmm. your 100% source of, of revenue and then that client left you. Um, that's that's a very high, um, uh, 100 percent concentration risk. You're yeah, if that yeah. one person leaves you, you're out of business. Uh, now think about a job, right? If your job is your only source of income, then you are at the highest level of concentration risk. Like you're very, you're already taking a lot of risk as is by having one com why 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 having one uh, one source of income. So um, mm. that that kind of like I think goes against where people think if they left their job and they started their own business that they'll be taking on more risk. True, you will be taking on more risk, but ultimately it's riskier to rely on your work, your job as a W two employee than it is to start your own. Uh, your own business. So think about you need multiple sources of income as you know, yeah. in plain simple. And it's not just not just revenue streams, it's actually employment streams. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I mean you, you can talk about, you know, sources of income, but you're also yeah. talking about sources of like what your output, you know, is is going yeah. toward. But I I love that the idea of just, you know, 
not putting all your eggs in one basket, yeah. you know, type yeah. thing. And, and, but it is, it is interesting that I think when people make a shift from say employment to uh, like entrepreneurship, I think you you're automatically introduced to two factors that I think entrepreneurs have to have. And I've, I've mentioned this before on the podcast. The, the first thing is you've got to have the, the risk of failure. Yeah. You know, you really feel that and it, it kind of drives your hunger. The second thing is you've got to have the reward of success. You know, those two things are like bookends, you know, to an entrepreneur's life that you've got to be rewarded for doing things well, but you've got to have that risk of failure too, that kind of keeps you, you know, sort of the lions at the gate, you know, type mm -hmm. thing that, that is always that, that kind of that drive and passing. If you don't have that just internally within you, but it sounds like to me that you've got a little bit of that in you anyway. Yeah, you're you're so right. It's not just about taking the risk, but also you have to think about like the the reward, right? Like what's what's the end result going to be? What's what are you ultimately manifesting or seeing? Mm -hmm. Um, and it has to, and it, and it really, I think like the the bigger the goal, the more likely you are to succeed as an entrepreneur. Yeah, N nobody becomes an entrepreneur to make fifty thousand dollars a year, right? Like people become an entrepreneur to make fifty million dollars a year. I'm not saying you will make fifty million dollars a year as an entrepreneur, but that's kind of like the um big goals, right? Like big goals will save you. Man, what a what a great chat we've had today. Just, uh, I mean, covered so much ground. Just to close us out today with where's the best place that people can find you online and uh, just learn more about your services. Yeah, well, Kevin, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, if listeners want to reach out to me, they can go to thinkinglikeabank.com. That's thinkinglikeabank.com. And then you could schedule a call with me. You could uh, download an ebook. You could uh, email me, connect with me on LinkedIn. All of that is found at thinking like a bank.com. There is a free ebook there that, uh, that I actually downloaded earlier today. Oh. So yeah, I appreciate you sending that copy, but, uh, man, it's, it's been so good to have a chat. I'd love to even the pre-chat before we hit the record yeah. button on here and, and would love to stay in touch with you for sure. But just thank you for just taking time today and just, just really sharing your story, sharing your expertise and thank really you. just doing your part to, to help all boats, right. All boats rise in a rising tide and have a great weekend. You too. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Make sure you follow up with our guests today and show them the support they deserve. As always, thank you for listening and playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide.